<clears throat> All right, so we're we're into the first chapter. Uh, essential ideas. So essential ideas. Essential ideas meaning that that uh, chemistry here we we feel that chemistry you know, chemists feel that chemistry is a central science. Now you could do math without chemistry. Uh, <clears throat> you could do um, physics without chemistry. You could do uh, you know, but th there's you can't do some sciences without some properties of chemistry, without some ideas of chemistry, without some math of, of chemistry. Uh, <clears throat> that, you know, in order to fully understand physics, you know, you need uh, chemistry. Uh, is that <clears throat> here, uh, chemistry can branch out uh, into uh, different math ideas. Uh, is that chemistry branches out into uh, biology, into biochemistry, into material <clears throat> science, you know. So we just have all these different uh, branches of chemistry, and we just really feel that, that chemistry is just a, a central science. And chemistry is based off of, and I'm sorry, it, it, it will flip around like this, so uh, I hope it doesn't get you guys dizzy uh, when it does that. So chemistry, physics, material science, biology, this is all, all these sciences are based on uh, observation and experimentation, right? So all these sciences are based on observation <clears throat> and Experimentation. Uh, and if you don't know if what I spelled here, just go ahead and stop me. And say, Alex, what did you just write? Because my my writing is is not that uh, great. I write better when I'm on a whiteboard in class, but uh, we have to deal with my tablet writing. So, <clears throat> right, based on observation and experimentation. I right. so we we do these experiments, we're, we're trying to, uh, we're attempting to answer questions, right? Uh, there's an attempt to answer questions, right? And explain, <clears throat> um, and explain our observations. Explain our observation uh, in terms of laws and theories, right? So chemistry based on observation, experimentation, and we try and explain these in terms of laws and theories. So <clears throat> what we begin with is we begin with, uh, excuse me, we begin with a hypothesis, right? <clears throat> and we treat, uh, we test this hypothesis by experimentation, by calculation, by comparison. By experimentation, calculation, calculations, or we draw on comparisons. <clears throat> okay, so with chemistry, uh, everything is uh, matter, right? Uh, your desk, the pencil you're using, the pen you're using, the watch you're wearing, the phone you have next to you, uh, the monitor you're looking at. This is all, all made of matter. And we define, let me use a new page for this. And we define matter 
as anything that occupies space and has mass. Anything that occupies space and has mass. Now we have different uh, states of matter, right? <clears throat> Not everything is solid, right? So we do have different states of matter, right? We have solids. Uh, we have liquids, we have gas, uh, and then we have a, a fourth one uh, called plasma, right? So we see that solids, solids are very rigid uh, and they have a definite shape to them. Right, uh, the ring that you're wearing is solid, has a definite shape. Uh, mouse pad that you have uh, is solid, has a definite shape. The calculator that you have is solid, has a, a definite shape to it. Right, um, if you have a bottleneck cup next to you, it's solid and there's a definite shape to it. Right, so these are our solid uh, states of matter. Then we have liquids. Right, uh, liquids flow. Um, and liquids take shape of the container that they're in, right? I got a cup of coffee in here, and <clears throat> this liquid takes the shape of the cup that, is in, that it's inside of, right? So there's no definite shape here. Uh, liquids take the shape of the container that they're in. Um, gases, um, actually, before we get into gases, uh, we should mention that solids also have a defined volume, right? Um, the solid is not going to, my cup is not going to get bigger. It's not going to get smaller, right? The cup that's next to me has a definite volume. And the liquid that's inside of this, right, also has a defined volume. Um, <clears throat> that my, the liquid that's, that's in that cup, headset went off, <clears throat> right? It's not going to increase in volume. It's not going to decrease in volume. Well, unless I take a drink. But other than that, if I just leave that coffee here, it's not going to increase or decrease in volume. Gases, however, are, are different. Gases, uh, like liquids, they do take uh, the shape of the container, but it also takes the volume of the container, right? If I have <clears throat> a closed bottle, uh, I have a, a closed uh, water bottle next to me. There's oxygen in there. Oxygen is the gas, and the volume of oxygen is there in there is whatever is the size of this bottle, right? If I open it up, well, that gas escapes, and now it takes up the size of the room. If I open up my front door, then that gas keeps expanding, right? So gases take up the shape and the volume of their container. If I put gas into a small uh, one milliliter bottle, 
well, the volume of that gas is one milliliter. If I take that same gas that's in the one milliliter bottle and I empty it into a five liter container, well, that gas is now taking the volume of that five liter container. So there is no defined volume for a gas. And plasma is a, is a fourth state. This is a fourth state. And here, this is where plasma um, is done at very high temperatures, and it's where particles are charged. We take these gas particles, and they become charged, and then it becomes plasma, right? Uh, so we'll put a, a fourth state where particles are electrically charged. High temp here. Done at very high temperatures. All right. <clears throat> now we can even make some drawings here that we were talking about. Right, so so for solids, right, I have this solid here, just kind of to explain this, right, here's my liquid here, and it's defined volume, uh, and then we have right, gases here, liquids, or liquids and then gases, right, my drawings aren't that great. So when we, we are kind of getting an understanding of what matter is, right? So there's other terms that we uh, are going to be, or we need to learn. And one of those terms is what we consider mass, right? So mass <clears throat> refers to how much matter is in whatever object that we're talking about, how much matter is in this solid, how much matter is in this liquid, how much matter <clears throat> is in this gas, right? All these little particles. So mass refers to how much matter is in it. Um, and this is much different than, than weight, right? Weight and matter are not the same. Right, weight and matter are not the same. Weight is the force of gravity, right? Uh, weight is the force of gravity. Um, the force of gravity that's exerted on some object, right? And that's our difference with mass uh, and with weight. So let's classify matter. Right? Uh, we know there's, there's three different, four different states of matter. Uh, well, let's classify matter into what we're going to call mixtures and pure substances. Right? Matter and pure substances. So here I have. We'll put, put matter at the, at the top here. So matter can be broken out into what we're going to consider pure substances and mixtures. So <coughs> pure substances, one 
way we can classify pure substance is our elements on the periodic table. All the elements on the periodic table are pure substances. Doesn't matter what element it is, you know, I'll give you a few examples, you know, um, silver, gold, uh, iron, oxygen, right? Those are all pure elements, pure substances, right? And we know that they're pure substances because we can't break them down any more chemically, right? We can't can't be broken down chemically, right? Elements cannot be broken down chemically. I can't break gold down into some other element. I can't break down silver into some other element. Yes, that I know that there's, uh, uh, do I know there's protons, neutrons, quarks, uh, nuon quarks, and I, do all that inside of an atom of, of silver? Yeah, I, I, we understand that to be in the atoms, but, but nothing, there's no other element that's going to go into making gold, right? So I can't take gold and break it down into another element. Uh, and then we have what we're going to call compounds. Um, compounds such as uh, water um, and uh, we'll say sucrose, right? These are what we're going to call pure substances. Now, the difference between our elements and our compounds um, for pure substances is that these can be broken down by chemical change. Some chemical process can break this down, right? Uh, I can't put um, water <clears throat> into uh, some sort of filter and separate the oxygen from the hydrogen, right? I can't take sugar, uh, sucrose, right? I can't take sugar and I can't put it into a filter and separate out the carbons, separate out the oxygens, separate out the hydrogens. Is that the only way to break this down is to chemically break it down. I could take water and I can put, a, oh, I'm sorry. I just saw some of the questions up here. I'll, I'll go back up there. Um, I can't take, I can take water um, and we can do electrolysis on water and we can we can separate the oxygen and the hydrogen from that, right? And we can do that. We can make some, do some chemical process in order to break those down. Uh, yeah, I'll go up to plasma for a second here. <clears throat> right, plasma, it's a fourth state where particles are electrically charged. And then I put high temperature uh, on there. Uh, then we have what we're going to consider mixture. So there's two types of mixtures that we have. So we have heterogeneous mixtures and we have homogeneous <coughs> mixtures. Now, um, heterogeneous mixtures, uh, these mixtures are what we're going to call not uniform. These are not uniform solutions, right? And I think the best, probably the best example of that is, is maybe like Italian dressing, bad Italian dressing anyway, stuff you buy at the store for 99 cents. Right, Italian dressing, <clears throat> is that um, you have to mix that stuff around. You see those little bits flying in there. Uh, even those, if you people remember those Orbit drinks, right? I don't know if you remember Orbit drinks. You have these little particles in here. But we can definitely separate some of that solution, right? I can take a filter um, and I can separate out the little particles 
um, from an easy, I could just use a coffee filter and separate out those big particles from the rest of the solution. So those are we're going to consider uh, heterogeneous solutions, is that they're not uniform solutions. All right, <clears throat> and then we have what we're going to call, these are uniform solutions. Right. Uniform solutions are, are stuff like, you know, uh, here's an example, right? Gatorade, right? It's a, it's a uniform uh, solution there. Coffee, right? Uniform solution. Love you. All right. I was just kissing my wife goodbye. She's going to... Got to get some work done. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, salt water, right? Salt water is a uniform solution. Um, I don't have to uh, do any uh, chemical process to salt water uh, to separate the salt from the water. All I need to do is uh, add a little heat to it, right? If I add a little, add a little heat to it, uh, then I can separate out that water from the salt there. So that's how we're going to uh, classify those uh, there. So um, chemical properties, physical properties. So chemical property versus a, a physical property versus a chemical property. Right. Um, <clears throat> physical properties are ideas like color, you know, uh, what, what the color of something is, right? That's a physical property. If I, if I see the pen on my desk, I see that it's green, and that is a physical property. Uh, the Xbox controller on my desk, right? That's it's black, right? That's a, a physical property, right? Uh, my watch is... Uh, brown there. That's a physical property of my watch. Um, hardness is a physical property. Uh, melting point. I'm going to put melting slash boiling. Melting and boiling points. Uh, how hot do we have to get something before it begins to melt, before it begins to boil? Those are our physical properties. Uh, density. Density is a physical property. Uh, we can put uh, electrical conductivity uh, as a physical property. All right. So... <clears throat> When uh, when ice melts, right? Ice melting is a is a physical change, right? Ice melting is not a chemical change, right? Uh, if I take an ice cube and I put it out on the counter, and that ice cube melts into uh, liquid, well, uh, the ice is water, and when it melts, it's still water. Right, so that's covering just some physical change. It didn't, it didn't change water into anything else. Uh, is that it just physically changed from solid to liquid? If I take that liquid and I put it into a pot and I boil it out into some gas, into some steam, uh, again, physical change. Right? Uh, I didn't, I didn't change the water into something else. Uh, it went from solid water to liquid water, uh, then to gas water. Right. Uh, if I grind a solid, right? If I take a block of cheese and uh, you know grind it up, you know it, it's you know it it's still cheese, whatever it is. Uh, if I take uh, whatever solid and aspirin and I grind it up into some powder, it's still a solid, right? Those are all physical changes. Physical properties, right? Uh, chemical properties. Um, Flammability would be considered a chemical property, right? Uh, that there are substances that can catch on fire more, re more readily than others, right? Uh, toxicity, 
uh, how toxic something is, uh, acidity. I'll put basicity here. So acidity, how, how acidic something is, how basic something is. Uh, reactivity. How reactive these elements, how reactive these substances can be. Uh, combustion. I'll put heat of combustion. <clears throat> and one rule of thumb for a uh, chemical change is that chemical changes always produce one or more types of matter different than the present change, right? Different than the present state that that matter was in. Um, combustion. Uh, let's see. So here's a reaction for combustion, and I'll give it. Let me write this down before we forget it. Too uh, is that we'll say chemical change chemical change always produces one or more types of matter <clears throat> that differ from that differ from the matter that's present We'll put before the change, All right? Uh, it's always going to produce some other type of matter. Uh, so if we take, uh, let's take uh, propane here. So if we take some propane, so here's some propane, and uh, let's see. This propane is uh, gas. We're going to add some oxygen gas to that. And we're going to get water, liquid, plus some carbon dioxide, gas, plus we're going to get some energy out of that, right? But here, I start with two gases, and I've now produced a liquid out of those two gases. All right. We've produced a liquid. So we're always going to produce at least one or more types of matter that different from the matter that's present, right? One or more types. I yes, I do have another gas, but we did produce at least produce one piece of matter that is different from the matter that was first present, right? I had two gases, and now I only have one gas, and I do have one liquid. <clears throat> so along with uh, properties of matter, along with properties of matter, we have what we consider extensive and intensive properties. So extensive properties. So an extensive property, um, these properties uh, depend on the amount of matter that's present. And I'll give you some examples, right? Uh, so volume, right? Volume... Um, is an extensive property, right? Um, if I have a, 
water, right? If I have a small cup of water, I have a small amount of volume, right? Uh, if I go down to 7-Eleven and get their big gulp, right, uh, the volume increases because I now have more of it, right? Uh, <clears throat> difference between a an eight milliliter water bottle and a 32 ounce liter of water, right? So extensive property, right? Um, how much I have um, fluctuates the volume, right? So volume uh, is definitely an extensive property. Uh, mass is another uh, extensive property, right? If I have one ounce of gold, it's going to uh, weigh in one ounce. If I have a uh, five ounces of gold, well, now it weighs five ounces, right? So the more I have of it, the more mass I have, right? Uh, <clears throat> so extensive property, um, heat capacity, heat capacity, Heat capacity is another extensive property, right? <clears throat> uh, just how um, hot or uh, how quickly or how slowly uh, a substance will absorb heat, right? Really depends on the amount that I have. It depends on the volume that I have, the mass that I have, and that will <clears throat> absorb or uh, release heat uh, depending on how much we have of it. Now, intensive properties, is not dependent on the amount we have. Is heat capacity equivalent to boiling point? No, heat capacity is not equivalent to boiling point. Um, heat capacity has to deal with, um, not at the point, uh, boiling point we can think of as, a, as a, some physical change, is that uh, here we have boiling point. Uh, and I'll kind of use a graph here. Um, so here, uh, let me draw this line here. All of a sudden, bam, we're going to just... wait, should we use this one? Let me see. How can I put this on a graph? Uh, boiling point. Go from uh, solid, no, let's go from liquid. Uh, from liquid to uh, gas. So this is kind of a, a, a phase change, right? Where uh, at some point <clears throat> uh, we have liquid. So, so we'll just use water uh, as an example. Um, you can heat water. Um, and we'll use uh, we'll use degrees Celsius. We won't use Fahrenheit. So at 100 degrees, degrees Celsius uh, is when pure water <clears throat> boils, right? So pure water boils at um, 100 degrees Celsius, and that's the point where water becomes, uh, goes from liquid to gas, right? Uh, it doesn't change to gas at 97 degrees, 95 degrees, 90 degrees. It gets really hot. It's got some really hot water, but it won't begin to boil until it reaches that 100 degrees Celsius point. So anything below that is going to remain a liquid. So that's our boiling point. Um, and uh, melting point can be thought of as, as the same way. Uh, is that here solid is at zero degrees Celsius is where pure water uh, is a solid. And anything over that 
again, we get a liquid. So uh, at one degree Celsius, this solid is going to start to melt and become liquid. <clears throat> so when we talk about heat capacity, heat capacity is the ability to uh, absorb heat. Um, is that heat capacity, not everything heats up at the same rate, right? Uh, if you go to the beach, I think the beach is a great example of heat capacity. Um, you go to the beach in the middle of summer, hot day, and you step out onto the blacktop, right? That blacktop is, is, will burn your feet off, right? So then you get to the, the sand. The sand is pretty hot, but it's tolerable. You can, you can walk on the hot sand. Um, and then you go to the wet sand and it's nice and cool. And then you go into the ocean water and it's pretty, you know, it's, it's like, you know, 60 some 65 degrees in the, in the water. So between the salt water, between the wet sand, between the dry sand, between the black top, they've all absorbed heat at different rates, right? Uh, the black top, which is the hottest, has been under the same sun the same amount of time, but it's definitely hotter than the sand. Well, the salt water has, you know, the, the I'm sorry, the, the, the wet sand has been uh, under the sun the same amount of time as the dry sand, but that wet sand, uh, because it has a little salt water in there, um, isn't as hot, right? So this is what we mean by um, heat capacity, right? Every substance has its own heat capacity and will get uh, hot at different rates. Does that answer your question, Juliet? Let's see here. Um, so intensive properties are not dependent on the amount of matter, right? Um, <clears throat> melting points and boiling points. Melting points and boiling points are intensive properties. It doesn't matter how much of something I have, as soon as it reaches a certain temperature, um, whether I have a gallon of water, whether I have a gram of water, whether I have a pool of water, right? Um, as soon as that pool of water uh, hits 100 degrees, it's going to start to boil, right? Um, whether I have a, a cup of water, as soon as, a, as soon as that water hits 100 degrees, it begins to boil. If I have a gram of water, as soon as it hits 100 degrees, it's going to start to boil, right? So uh, melting point, boiling points, doesn't really matter uh, how much of it I have. Uh, as soon as the substance, as soon as the compound reaches that boiling point, that melting point temperature, um, it will begin to melt or boil. Uh, concentration. So concentration uh, is also not dependent on, on the amount that I have. <clears throat> um, density. Density is a ratio of uh, mass to volume, um, and whether I have, uh, and density again is an intense, it doesn't matter how much of it I have, the density of uh, any object, substance, compound is always going to be the same, um, whether I have a gram of it or whether uh, I have uh, a kilogram of it, the, the density does not change. <clears throat> All right, so uh, now we get, what time is it? It's 8.41, all right, we're doing good on time. So now we can get into uh, measurements. So I think we've covered uh, quite a few terms. Um,
uh, that now we can get into measurements. So what measurements are, measurements are uh, units um, for how we can pair uh, different measurements. So uh, units are standards of comparison for measurements. Right, so we use these units to compare different measurements. Right, uh, if I have something that is uh, two liters, and I want to compare it to something that is four liters, right? I can't. I can't just do this. Two versus four. Well, what? Two frogs versus four puppies. Uh, you know, two cars versus two buses, right? Now I need some unit to know what we're talking about. So here we can put two liters versus four liters, right? I have a quarter pound versus one pound. Right. So again, units are just standards we use for comparing different measurements. Here I have two different measurements. I've measured out two liters. I measured out four liters, right? And now the liters is our unit, right? The unit here. Here is our unit so that we can make a comparison of these measurements. Uh, then we have something that we call SI units. SI units are fixed by some, um, yes, I am recording the lecture. Uh, so SI units are, are fixed by international agreement. Um, so that scientists uh, can communicate all around the world without having different standards. Uh, you know, it's not going to make sense if we're using um, pounds and inches and the rest of the world is using uh, different uh, units that, that we want all our units to be uniform. And so when we write papers, when we study science and we study chemistry, is that we refer to and use SI units, which are fixed units. Right. So when we talk about uh, volume, uh, the SI unit, and actually let me put So if we talk about volume, the SI unit for volume uh, is the cubic meter, right? And that's our SI unit for volume. Um, length <clears throat> length we use the meter. That's our SI unit there. Uh, mass, uh, we use the kilogram. Uh, time, time is done in seconds. Uh, temperature, Kelvin. Um, current. We use the amp, the ampere. Uh, energy. It's what's called a joule. Right. <coughs> so all of these are understood to be 
uh, SI units, right? So when we're reading papers, uh, everything is referred to in cubic meters. Uh, and if it's not in cubic meters, then we convert it to cubic meters, right? Uh, if it's not in meters, we convert it to meters. If it's not in kilograms, we convert it to kilograms. So in chemistry, uh, there is a difference here, but because we also, we use what, what, what's called the the metric system, right? And the metric system is not to be confused with SI units, uh, is that yes, some of these are based off of the metric system, right? Um, volume uses me cubic meters. The meter is a metric unit, right? Based off of the metric system, right? So the metric system just a general metric system, length, we're going to use meter. Uh, for mass, uh, we use grams. Everything is based off of grams. Uh, volume, we're going to use liters. And These are what we uh, we're going to be using quite a bit. So just understand that that these are what we call SI units. These are standardized units. Uh, these are fixed by international agreement, and some of them do involve using the metric system, right? Our metric system of length, mass, volume, um, and we use this system because we can use multiples of these base units, right? So these here are base units. And the best thing about the metric system is that we can use multiples of these base units, right? So what this can give us is this can give us um, what we call uh, some comet unit prefixes. <clears throat> right, these are what we consider multiple multiples of our base, right? And they're always in powers of 10, right? Always in powers of 10. Uh, so we start off with, uh, right? Terra, T, and that's going to be 10 to the 12. Uh, giga, capital G, that's 10 to the 9. Uh, mega, Capital M to the six, low three, uh, and then we have the smaller ones here that go smaller, so we can go uh, deci and then ten, and that's going to be our d ten to the minus one centi. And all the way down to, I think we'll stop at Femto. All right, do you have to know them all? Yes, you have to know all of them, right? Uh, <clears throat> but we always use these base units, right? Here's our base units. Meter gram, liter, and we use these prefixes in front of that, right? So if I have a millimeter, right? So we can say that uh, seven centimeters 
is equal to seven times, right? Here it is, 10 to the minus two, seven times 10 to the minus two meters. Seven times 10 to the minus two meters. Uh, if I have uh, five kilograms, this is equal to five. Where's our prefix for kilo? It's 10 to the three, five times 10 to the three grams. But always based off of these, uh, always based off of our base units. They're multiples of our base units. Uh, let's do one more example here. Uh, we'll say uh, three picoliters, right? This is equal to five, oh no, not five, three. Three times pico is 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 12 liters. <sighs> What we don't want to do, right? And uh, this is uh, this becomes uh, a mistake sometimes in using this these prefixes. So let's go with um, let's use let's use this example here. So let's use uh, kilo, right? And some students use this a little backwards and they see that k means 10 to the 3 kilo is 10 to the 3 so they say okay well uh, that means 10 to the 3 kilometers is equal to 1 meter and that is absolutely untrue if you know what 10 to the 3 is 10 to the 3 is 10 times 10 times 10 right? 10 times 10 is 100, times 10 is 1,000, and 1,000, what this false statement is saying is that 1,000 kilometers is equal to one meter. Well, think about it. Kilometers is about three quarters of a mile, so you're saying 1,000 kilometers is equal to one meter. One meter is a little bit smaller than a yardstick, right? A little smaller than three feet. So there's no way that this is going to work, right? So please make sure that you're using these prefixes correctly uh, and not mixing those around there. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So uh, more terms. We are definitely into more terms before we start any real calculations here. All right. So just to go over some more terms here, right? Uh, length is a length is a measurement uh, of some. Right, length is a measurement of some distance. Um, mass, we've already talked about mass, but we'll say mass is um, a measurement of matter that um, an object Um, makes up, right? Mass is a matter or takes up, right? Uh, temperature, we haven't really talked about temperature. Uh, temperature is a physical quantity, some measurement, right? Some physical quantity that expresses hot or cold, All right? And volume, introduce the word here, but let's have a definition um, of volume. Volume is a measure of 
volume is a measure of amount of space occupied by an object. Right, and volume and SI units, right? Remember volume and SI units um, <coughs> is equal to meters cubed. <clears throat> and we can even draw that out, right? So here, um, right, what it means by meters cubed, how can meters cubed be volume? And it's very simple how to, to understand that, right? So here we have this 3D cube, right, where, oh, Here we have this 3D cube, we're a meter wide, a meter tall, uh, we're a meter uh, thick, right? One meter times one meter times one meter is meters cubed, right? And so volume is the amount of space that this cube is occupying, right? We can have a smaller cube, right? What if we make this cube here? But this time we'll say centimeter, one centimeter, and this is one centimeter, and this is a centimeter cubed, right? You guys ever heard of cc's? Anybody in the medical field, right? You're using cc's, right? That's an amount of volume. That is a volume. That is a measure, min amount of space occupied by some object, right? One cubic centimeter, right? And this is equal to, well, to one milliliter. One cubic centimeter equal to one milliliter, right? Um, one meter cubed is not equal to one liter. One meter cubed is equal to 1,000 liters, right? So uh, please don't get that confused there. <clears throat> So density, man, I got to practice my writing here. So density, so density is a ratio, right? Density is a ratio, uh, let's say of mass, to volume, right? Density is a ratio of mass to volume. So we say that density is equal to mass over volume. Right? That density is equal to mass over volume. And if we're talking about SI units, right, the SI unit for mass, the SI unit for volume, <clears throat> right, here's our, our SI units. So the SI unit for mass is kilogram, the SI unit for volume is meters cubed. So if we're talking about SI units uh, for density, right, uh, we would see that this is going to be kilogram over meters cubed, right? But when we talk about when we talk about it this way, uh, this is this is sort of inconvenient. Right, because we don't really deal with kilograms um, in chemistry. We, we deal with, with grams, with milligrams. We don't deal with kilograms. This is a really huge unit. Uh, we don't deal with, you know, in the unless you're a chemical engineer, we don't deal with thousands of liters of volume. So this is kind of an inconvenient way um, of expressing it. So what we do use it for uh, is that if we're talking about, generally if we're talking about solids in chemistry, uh, is that we're going to use grams over um, cubic uh, centimeters, right? Uh, we use this for gases or for solids. We use it for uh, liquids. Uh, and then gases 
gases, we generally use grams over liters. All right, uh, and then we'll even we can even use grams over um, milliliters if we're talking about liquids here. <clears throat> but if it's solids, we're using um, you know grams over cubic centimeters. If we're talking about liquids, grams over cubic centimeters or grams uh, per milliliter, uh, grams per meter, kilograms per meter cubed is just a really inconvenient way of uh, of using this. So. Um, we can actually use this formula, right? So now that we know some of these units, uh, we can actually make a calculation, right? Uh, is that if I were to ask you, uh, what is the volume, what is the volume of a cube where each side is 0 0.843 centimeters, right? What is the volume of a cube where each side is 0 0.843 centimeters, right? Well, we can definitely use this density is equal to mass over volume. What we need to try to figure out here uh, <clears throat> is what the volume is here. Uh, well, <clears throat> In order to help us figure out what this volume is, we need to figure out the density just that we don't we don't quite need we don't quite I shouldn't have put that there. We don't quite need this yet. But in order to understand the volume of a cube, you you do need to understand volumes that you've all taken math 105. So I'm assuming you all know how to calculate the volume of a rectangle, the right volume of a cylinder, volume of a, a sphere, volume of a cube, right? Uh, that's not something that I'm going to reteach, right? So uh, you know volume of a square volume of a cube, right? Length times width times height. Uh, and they all happen to be, because it's a cube, they all happen to be the same, right? So we put 0.843 centimeters times 0.843 centimeters times 0.843 centimeters. And this happens to equal so we could just put it to the third power? You can absolutely just put it to the third power. 0.843 centimeters cubed. And this comes out to be 0.599 cubic centimeters. Is that right? Somebody double check my math here. Yes, it's right. All right. So 0.55 centimeters cubed. All right, so we can actually go a little bit further now. We can say, well, um, if, if this cube – so if this cube was copper uh, and had a density of – 8.91 uh, grams per cubic centimeter, uh, what's the mass of the cube? And when I write stuff like this, you'll, you'll, you're going to see this quite often when I do this. And I do this because it helps me calculate a little bit easier, um, is that I don't, I don't do this. If I see something like this, they mean the exact same thing, 8.91 grams per cubic centimeter is the same thing as me writing 8.91 grams per cubic centimeter. This means the exact same thing, right? But generally, I, generally I don't use this form uh, because it, it, 
I like to make it just it's a little bit more difficult with calculations uh, because you know maybe we can't see something correctly because we're going to be doing a lot of cross canceling like for the next 16 weeks we're just going to be cross canceling everything we possibly can all right so here we can actually go ahead and use our formula now of density equals mass over volume and we've given you the density well, do we know what the volume is? Yeah, we just calculate the volume, right? So here's our volume right here. So with that, we can actually calculate the mass of the cube, but we do have to rearrange this real quick. So if we rearrange this, uh, density times volume is equal to mass, and then we can plug in our values of 8.91 grams per centimeter cubed multiplied by our volume, 0.599 centimeters cubed, and we can see that these units now cancel out. And our answer, 5.34 grams. Uh, and that is our mass. Right. Uh, or any subset. Or, I, and I know that this is my mass. I know the answer is right. And I know it's mass because I know the volume. I, I'm sorry. I know the mass here. Right. Metric system. Mass is in grams. Volume is in liters or some s subset of liter. Could be milliliter, could be picoliter. But I know that, you know, the difference between my mass, length and volume here. So as long as it, I'm answering the question correctly, it's asking me for mass. My units are in grams, which is in mass. My answer is correct. Now, um, we'll get into, could we, let me see how much more we have. So we, we, I'm going to pause this video, pause the recording real quick. <clears throat> 